I'm Sarah Miller McCune, founder and chair of Sage Publishing. And I'm here today with Professor William Julius Wilson of Harvard University. And we're here at the Center for Advanced Study in the Social and Behavioral Sciences. Bill, I was hoping that we could begin our discussion by my asking you why you chose to become a sociologist. Well, let me just say, first of all, Sarah, that it's a real privilege and honor to be sitting next to you. <laughs> and to well, I feel even more so. I'm a, a, a charter member of your fan club. Uh, oh, uh, you just made my day. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, um, I went to a historically uh, black college, Wilberforce University in Ohio. And I started out as a major in business administration. And I took a course from a brilliant black sociologist, Dr. Maxwell Brooks, who uh, the course was in social problems and there was a focus on McCarthyism. And I just found the course fascinating. So I decided to take another course from this professor. It was uh, crime and science and society or something like that, you know. And after that experience, uh, I decided to switch majors. <laughs> switch my major from uh, business, business administration to sociology. And when I decided to enroll in graduate school, I, I decided to become a sociologist. What's interesting, however, is that in graduate school, I didn't take any courses uh, dealing with race relations, urban poverty, social stratification, areas that I have written about. I was focusing on the philosophy of social science and emphasizing research methodology and theoretical methodology. And my first uh, publication was Formalization and Stages of Theoretical Development. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But when I arrived at uh, uh, Amherst, uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst, which was my first position, it was right at the time of the Civil Rights Movement, and I was following very, very closely uh, Martin Luther King Jr., and uh, I just got caught up in the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to sort of read more in the field of race relations. I wasn't impressed with a lot of the uh, studies that were being published at the time that were being cranked out, I should put it, uh, emphasizing race in America. Uh, they were polemical for the most part, uh, highly rhetorical. And I decided that if I'm going to really learn something about race, I'm going to have to read more substantial works. And then I started to read, to read some really good theoretical works uh, by people like Robin Williams Jr., Robin Williams Jr., uh, people like uh, R.A. Shermer Horn, uh, 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 Hubert Blaylock. And on the basis of reading their works, and reflecting on my own experiences in theoretical methodology, I wrote a book entitled Power, Racism, and Privilege, Race Relations and Theoretical and Socio-Historical Perspectives. A terrible title. <laughs> Since then, I've learned how to, how to select titles. And uh, it was a study, a comparative study of race relations in the Republic of South Africa uh, and the United States. And after I completed the book, when it was in press, I realized that I had tended to focus on African Americans as a monolithic socioeconomic group. And I became aware that there was a growing split, schism, between the poor and the better off blacks, a gap that was growing gradually. Uh, and then when I moved from the Univ University of Massachusetts Amherst to the University of Chicago and walking around the city of Chicago, that's when I realized that I really should be focusing more on this split, this growing gap between the haves and have-nots in the black community. 
And this led to the writing of The Declining Significance of Race. The title is extremely uh, misleading because it's a very pessimistic book uh, where I talked about economic class as becoming more important than race in determining one's life chances. And I talked about the growing gap between the haves and have-nots. It was a very, very controversial book. Generated a lot of discussion, a lot of debate. A lot of blacks were upset with me, but they hadn't read the book carefully. And many of them were upset because of what I had to say about the uh, uh, gains of the black middle class. Uh, now, it's conventional wisdom that there's a split between poor blacks and, and, and more uh, affluent blacks. But at that time, the, the controversy focused on my arguments about the uh, improving position of trained and educated blacks. And so I was motivated to write a sequel to the declining significance of race, which resulted in the publication of The Truly Disadvantaged focusing more on the plight of poor blacks. And in so doing, I developed an overarching theory that uh, in incorporated the works of scholars from different disciplines, a theory that focused on concentrated poverty, a theory that also associated the uh, growing joblessness of poor blacks with changes in the economy and so on. And this book, The Truly Disadvantaged, created a, 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 you know, a paradigm that stimulated research uh, across disciplines. But that's a long answer <laughs> to your question of how I ended up as a social scientist or as a sociologist. Well, in fact, this, this is so perfect because when I think of you, I have difficulty distinguishing between Bill is a sociologist and Bill is a social scientist because reading your works, including the truly disadvantaged, I see you as a social scientist. Yes. And I see that interdisciplinary focus in your work as a great part of why your work has stood the test of time, which leads me to my second question, actually, which is that since I believe, and many of my colleagues at SAGE believe, that academic work is too often trapped in disciplinary silos. Um, I wonder how it is that work such as the truly disadvantaged and when work disappears have managed to attract such an interdisciplinary audience. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a, very, a, a very good question. Um, First of all, uh, you know, I'm really pleased when you told me that you had read my, my work. <laughs> uh, and, and you know that, that I engage the works of historians, economists, political scientists, sociologists. Uh, and I address issues that uh, a lot of people in other disciplines are concerned about. And, and you I, focus on public right, policy. Right, and I focus on public policy, and I pull, I, I'm, I'm able to sort of integrate uh, these things. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of proud of that. That's what my, my ability to sort of integrate works from different disciplines in you know, developing a coherent uh, argument that really sort of presents a big picture of inequality uh, in, American, uh, in American society. Uh, you know, this reminds me that uh, uh, economists uh, read my work and cite my work a lot. And one day I was walking down the hall. One of the uh, buildings at the University of Chicago was on a weekend. It was a Sunday. And I ran into Robert Lucas the Nobel Prize winner in economics in 1995. He says, Bill, this was a Sunday afternoon. He says, guess what? I says, what? He says, I've been reading The Truly Disadvantaged. I says, that's great. He says, and you know what? I've learned something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and that, uh, the, that, that pleased me. And then I, uh, a couple of years later, I received an email from uh, Stephen Levitt, author of uh, Freakonomics, and... Uh, he had written a paper on the uh, 
theorists who have uh, been cited most or influenced research in microeconomics, and I was rated in the top 10. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm pleased that my work has engaged scholars from, from, uh, from different disciplines. I think it's very important. And when you, if you're a student, you take my classes, you see that I have works that I assign readings representing uh, different disciplines. That's great. How is it, though, that you've been able to turn issues that most Americans wish to ignore into matters that policymakers and politicians feel required, impelled to address? Well, you know, first of all, I think uh, one reason is, is that my work is, uh, is accessible. Uh, it's read by uh, not only scholars, but you know, uh, educated lay readers and, uh, and policy makers. Um, and I've been very pleased that people at the highest level have been reading my books. Uh, I recall um, uh, it was uh, President Clinton invited me to uh, his economic summit conference in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1992 before he assumed the presidency. And I was one of the few uh, non-economists uh, invited. Economists, financial analysts dominated the conference. And I was on a panel discussion with uh, Hillary Clinton, and B Bill Clinton chaired the panel. And when he introduced me, he said, uh, I don't know how many of you uh, have read uh, The Truly Disadvantaged. And he says, I recommend the book. And then he proceeded to sort of summarize in a few succinct sentences some of the major arguments of the book. And then he concluded by saying, and it's only 187 pages of text, <laughs> so it won't take long to read. So the first thing I did when I got home, I pulled the book off the shelf. I pulled the truly disadvantaged off the shelf. It says, yeah, 187 pages of text. Yeah, so I am... Pleased that policymakers have uh, have read my work. I, I recall um, when the Truly Dis Disadvantaged was published. Uh, I got a, I received a call from from Bill Bradley's office. Said the senator wanted to meet with me. Uh, flew to New York and uh, and I met with him. And he had his advisors uh, in his office and he told everybody to go out. And we just had a one on one conversation for about an hour, talking about the arguments and the Truly Disadvantaged. You know what he told me? He says, your book was very timely because Charles Mary had, wrote, had written Closing, uh, um, closing Ground. Or what, I've forgotten the exact name of the book. Closing Ground. And conservatives were uh, citing the book and talking about it. And we, we didn't have anything to counter the arguments of the conservatives because, uh, oh, losing ground, that's the title <laughs> of the book, losing ground. Uh, they didn't have anybody to sort of uh, counter the arguments of the conservatives who cited and discussed frequently Charles Murray's arguments until The Truly Disadvantaged was published. And he says, you gave the liberals something to talk about and to respond to the Charles Murray argument. That pleased me a great deal. And so it should. Um, in your long and storied career, what academic achievement are you most proud of? I think uh, the thing that pleased me most, first of all, of well, two things, if I might add, was being elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Mm -hmm. A great honor. And secondly, receiving the National Medal of Science. Let me talk about the first one. Uh, when I was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1992, uh, I received a letter from uh, David Blackwell, the late uh, mathematician at Berkeley. And he said, Dear Professor Wilson, uh, congratulations on being elected to the Academy. He says, now when anyone asks me if I'm the only black member of the National Academy of Sciences, I will be delighted to say no. <laughs> <laughs> that 
I mean, th that pleased me, you know, I mean, because in this sense, it was a statement that reflected the level of scholarship, you know, that I've reached a threshold and I was recognized for what I've accomplished. The second thing was uh, the National Medal of Science. The National Medal of Science is an award that's uh, based on recommendations by uh, a committee from the National Academy of Sciences to the President of the United States. And the Nobel Prize winner in economics, Kenneth Arrow, wrote the citation uh, for that award. And, and that pleased me a great deal. That award given at the White House, I was the, the one social scientist receiving the National Medal of Science in uh, 1998. There were seven uh, natural scientists who received the award. And at the award ceremony, uh, when, again, when, when President Clinton uh, introduced me and talked about the award, and he proceeded to talk about the uh, uh, truly disadvantaged again. And afterwards, the natural scientists came to me. They were impressed that the president <laughs> of the United States had read my work and understood it. <laughs> That's great. What advice would you give to the next generation of social scientists well, I've been concerned that so many scholars have been writing papers and books that address issues that can be easily quantified, that focus narrowly on issues, uh, and that seem to be geared to a select audience within a scholar's particular field. And I would like to see scholars attempt to engage the broader population more. I would like to see them. I think economists do a much better job of this than sociologists do, for example. I think that uh, policymakers, the media pay more attention to the works of economists. And, uh, I wish that sociologists, and I'm speaking to sociologists now, as a sociologist, I think I, I wish that sociologists would be more concerned about discussing issues uh, that are high on the public agenda and uh, uh, engage uh, policy uh, makers more. I remember when I was uh, president, elected president of the uh, American Sociological Association and in the first meeting of the Council of the American Sociological Association, people were talking about what can we do to receive more attention in the media? And I couldn't relate to that conversation because I was bombarded <laughs> with requests from the media. Why? Because I was addressing, addressing issues they were concerned about. And so I tried to tell, particularly younger scholars, I tried to tell them to or I emphasize the importance of uh, conducting research and trying to reach a broader audience, not just narrowly members in your particular field. That's critical. Right. And of course, it's something that I heartily agree with. So thank you so much. And I really want to thank everybody who's listening. This has been a truly fascinating conversation, and I've enjoyed it greatly.